Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our latest speaker with friends webinar. As you can see, we're tackling SDG 11 this month, uh, sustainable cities and communities, and in particular 11.7, um, which states by 2030, provide universal access to safe, inclusive and accessible green and public spaces, in particular for women and children, older persons and persons with disabilities. And we'll be discussing equitable landscapes in particular with a focus on the issues around the inclusivity of our public spaces and how to value them properly in terms of their social, cultural and, envir <coughs> sorry, and environmental contributions. Um, I'd like to also welcome Jane, who's Director of FIRA and President of the Landscape Institute this morning. Um, Marie, uh, who uh, is going to talk about many things, but particularly um, the contents of her recent book. Um, she's a landscape architect and urban designer, and her book is New Life in Public Squares. And Christopher, who is Planning and Develop Development Manager at Axiom Developments Limited. So welcome to the three of you. And what all three share is a wealth of experience around the creation and valuation of our outdoor spaces and what we really need to change in our society if the true value of the landscape is going to be recognised. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Romy, the commercial director of Vestra here in the UK. So this is a recent addition, this slide. I just wanted to um, add it because uh, I think it's very timely and I think that's the reason we've had such interest uh, today in, in this webinar. Um, I don't expect you necessarily to read through it all, but please do look it up, Google it, Sir Michael Marmot, UCL and um, COVID inequalities. But it's quite clear that we were experiencing huge issues with equity and inequality in this country before COVID. And in terms of public health and spending on public services, I think it's, it's just become worse and worse. And this is quite a damning report. Um, and I think very much linked to what we're talking about today. You know, we know that landscapes and healthy cities uh, lie at the heart of, of much of um, what we can do to improve things. So I want to move on quite rapidly to our three speakers. And um, we're going to run them in this order. Marie will be talking about um, her, her book contents and how public space can contribute to making cities and communities more sustainable first. And then we'll move on to Jane and Chris. And after that, uh, we'll have a, a session, hopefully a lengthy one, um, to discuss all of the things that we've talked about there and uh, any questions you have. So please do add questions at any stage into the Q&A section and we'll go through those shortly. So thanks, Marie. I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, when you're ready with your presentation, if that's OK. Thank you very much. OK. Yep, I think so. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, very nice to be here and to be um, and have been invited as well. I'll just give a little bit of background to um, what the sort of session um, is about today. The impact of COVID-19 has made us appreciate our health, being part of the community and the outdoors. We have found pleasure in simply being outdoors, particularly in parks and public spaces. Through walking and cycling, we have discovered our neighbourhoods and in many cases, our neighbours. There are two aspects of the ongoing pandemic that resonate with SDG 11. One is the value of community, of being local. Open space is a key component within what is referred to as the 15 minute city context, which is based on the distances that people can comfortably walk or cycle. It's about limiting traffic and its adverse environmental impacts to enable healthy cities and communities to thrive. The second point is the heightened appreciation and significant role of public spaces within our urban areas. Easy access to quality open space is fundamental to having a good life in our cities. Public spaces are focal points. They help to define neighborhoods, connect communities, and give a sense of being and well-being. 
So let's have a look at some examples as you know, part of the discussion of how public spaces can, ex can transform the experience of living in the city and contribute to creating sustainable communities. Is that? Sorry. Have you got your arrow that moves it on, oh. Marie? Can you see? Oh yeah, anything? I have. I've got an arrow as well. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry about that's that. A, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, just... you've skipped one. Oh right. My my apologies. It won't be the, the first actually. Um, right. Some forty years ago, Barcelona recognised the importance of public space in re-establishing communities across the city. Creating places where people could congregate was an expression of the new democracy in the post-Franco era. From the redesign of historic squares that celebrated the city's past to retrofitting new spaces that reinforced Catalonia's cultural identity. These projects spoke to the people of Barcelona. Larger projects included parks that were created on old industrial land, strengthening the identity of neighborhoods to the ambitious scheme to connect the city to the sea. This reconfigured the relationship of existing city quarters by linking them to the sea and the city and created the context for new emerging residential areas. Barcelona Public Space Service Directorate, more recent aim has been to create Barcelona as a livable city by removing roads to enable public spaces, play areas and markets to be introduced that reconnect communities reinforcing what it is to live local. While the Supergrid initiative aims to improve the environment by restricting vehicle access within this residential zone, to promote walking and cycling and to introduce more street planting. Land uses that are not appropriate to being within housing areas are being relocated to allow small neighborhood parks to be created. Like Barcelona, a city-wide approach has been taken by Leicester City Council based on an ongoing public realm strategy, which has created a pedestrian city centre through the introduction of a spatial hierarchy of streets and spaces, applying a prescriptive palette of materials and street furniture to define a series of city quarters, and reducing the severance caused by the inner ring road, enabling better and safer pedestrian and cycle connections between the city's retail, universities and residential areas to be made. So that's there also at a sort of um, what I would call as you know citywide scale that provides a sort of pedestrian orientated environment with a variety of open spaces that are well connected and accessible. We'd now like to look at how new city quarters use the public realm not only to give identity a sense of place for future communities but also to integrate the new development with their existing urban structure. In central Oslo, the new city quarters are virtually car free which maximizes the available pedestrian space. These quarters have been designed around a series of open spaces with pedestrian and cycle routes and long vistas that connect the city center to the fjord. The character and scale of the space has changed responding to their location from busy, vibrant places within the quarters, retail and restaurant hubs to quieter green areas that capture the tranquility and beauty of the fjord. Within the new city quarter, there is a museum, an outdoor sculpture park and a beach. These recreational and cultural destinations are part of the Fjord City Plan that aims to establish focal points along Oslo's emerging waterfront promenade, which integrates this and future developments with the wider city context. In other cases, the urban fabric needed to be repaired. An old city, an old gasworks in St. Helier was replaced by a car park when gas production stopped. However, the local community saw the site as an opportunity to create a much needed park where there was no local open space. The Millennium Town Park, which is ungated, unites the surrounding neighborhoods through pedestrian and cycle connection and the hosting of events. The Friends Group, which helps manage and maintain the park, reinforces the integration of the community. The facilities, which were selected by the local people include play and sports facilities, water features and seating areas. Community action for improved public spaces and the term social capital can be traced back 
to Jane Jacobs' book, The Life and Death of Great American Cities, published in 1961, and the emergence of the Pocket Park movement, of which Paley Park in New York is the most well known. The local community in central London wanted change. Leicester Square, a historic space, had suffered from years of neglect and high levels of antisocial behaviour that made it an unattractive place for residents and visitors alike. The gardens were previously cluttered and closed off and felt isolated from their surroundings. While the gardens and terraces were disconnected and much of the terraces underused. The reimagined Leicester Square was developed with the local residents and businesses. The gardens and terraces were designed as one place with the mirrored railings blurring the edges of being inside or outside the gardens while the sinuous white ribbon forms a series of spaces within the terraces and provides informal seating opportunities that encourages people to stop and stay for free. The chevron paths entice people to move effortlessly into the gardens, whose historic character has been reinvented, including an interactive water feature around the Shakespeare fountain and generous seating. What we have seen is that public spaces transform the urban landscape and improve people's lives. Outdoor spaces are sanctuaries that can be ret retrofitted by removing vehicular space to create a place, or by transforming an existing route into a green oasis. While within new city quarters, the design of the public realm is central to an emerging identity and a way of integrating new developments with an existing urban form. For example, Canary Walk at Granary Square is linked to the Regent's Canal by a series of Gantt style steps. Public spaces offer a variety of experiences from participating in an event that brings people together to, in, to interacting, having fun and expressing enjoyment, to being given the simple opportunity to sit down or finding peace in nature. Public spaces need to be local and accessible to everybody who lives in an urban area. They are vital supporting the well-being of the individuals that make up our communities, which in turn sustains the longevity of cities as places to live, enjoy and be happy. Thanks very much. Thanks, Marie. I feel like we should applaud, <laughs> even if it's virtual. Um, that was brilliant and a great introduction to what we're talking about here. Um, so thank you. We'll move on to Jane and uh, her presentation on healthy landscapes. Um, and I think that will hopefully seamlessly flow together. Uh, so are you ready to start? Yeah, we'll see if I can get to sharing my screen, Romy. Perhaps you can yeah. tell me if you'd be able to see this. Yeah, sure. We've got applause from somebody else, not just me. Oh, excellent. Yeah, you're sharing. I'll, I'll hide now. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. So this morning, um, I, I've always been interested in how our environment can affect our health, and it's uh, more relevant today than it's ever been. And I'm going to look at how the evidence, at the evidence, and how we can use that evidence to promote healthy places for people. And I would suggest that good health underpins resilient, sustainable, and thriving communities. So as we emerge from the pandemic, we'll all have been re-evaluating what's most important to us. And there's now been a very bright spotlight on access to parks and green spaces as people have found a new love for their local park and for their back garden. And I think the three most important challenges we face as humans are completely interlinked as the climate change, biodiversity crisis and human health. And it's very clear that human health is dependent on biodiversity. And contact with nature is an innate human need and this affinity is associated with our evolutionary dependence on nature to provide all our essential resources for survival. And there's now a wealth of research that demonstrates the positive impact of nature on people's physical health, on how they feel and how they behave. And it provides us as design professionals with the evidence we need to justify the investment into green space. And I do think that landscape professionals are well placed to deliver them. And so throughout history, diseases have shaped our cities as epidemics lead to significant change in planning and the development of infrastructure. And the classic examples of this are the cholera epidemics of the mid 19th century caused by squalid living conditions 
resulting in thousands of deaths in London and other major industrial cities in Britain. In the, uh, in the extremely hot summer of 1858, London came to a complete standstill where there was a overwhelming stench that came from the River Thames and it was known then as the Great Stink. And it was basically caused by the river uh, being an open sewer and it was the most polluted river in the world at that time and thousands of people died of cholera. This eventually led to the connection between the occurrence of cholera epidemics and polluted drinking water and resulted in the building of a new and modern sewage system in London and the Victoria Embankment, which you can see in this slide on the north side of the Thames. And this has become one of London's most iconic examples of great Victorian public realm. Of course, there's a massive sewer underneath there. And in fact, at the same time in Paris, uh, the city was refashioned following numerous cholera epidemics with tree-lined boulevards, squares and city parks in order to improve public health. Now this slide is the first purpose-built park in the world. It's in Birkenhead, which is my hometown. You might be able to tell from my accent. And the, um, the town rapidly expanded in the 1840s. Uh, the town leaders wanted to avoid the public health issues experienced by its neighbour, Liverpool. So they commissioned Joseph Paxton to design a park at the heart of the town for everybody to enjoy, to improve the, the clean air and to improve the health of the local people. And of course, we all know that Birkenhead Park inspired the design for New York Central Park. It too was blighted by cholera and a design competition for a new park around which Upper Manhattan developed was won by Frederick Law Olmsted. Central Park is a beautiful green oasis in the middle of the city and 160 years later it's as, as relevant today as it was then and it's a fantastic and iconic legacy for New York. You need to just look at it, you instinctively know that this is good for us. So it looks as though COVID-19 is joining this long list of infectious diseases that have had an enduring mark on our urban planning and city spaces. We know that green spaces and contact with nature is important for our health and well-being, but many of our towns and cities are still devoid of trees. Now, this is Birmingham, the UK's second city where I live and work, and there's hardly a tree in sight in the city centre. Sadly, 80% of the public realm in the UK are highways and green space is often the area left over. So I'm advocating that we act on the evidence, we reevaluate how we design and retrofit our towns and cities with landscape so nature is at the heart of them, so they become more resilient to the effects of climate change and also to promote a healthy people. We know we're facing a ticking time bomb in public health and this will be exacerbated by the climate and biodiversity emergency. It's a perfect storm and this was before COVID Research shows that poor access to green space causes life-limiting disease, both physical and mental health. In 2019, the World Health Organization report highlights a global epidemic of childhood inactivity. And only this week, Ella Adu Kissy Deborah, the young girl who died following an asthma attack, has become the first person in the UK to have pollution listed as a cause of death. I'm suggesting by using the evidence, using evidence-based design, we move from a position where our parks and uh, parks, public green space are not just a nice to have, but where they become essential infrastructure in our towns and cities. And evidence-based design is the process of designing a building or a physical environment based on scientific research to achieve the best possible outcomes. And it has its origins in medical practice where research shows that hospital design can affect patient recovery. We know we face enormous healthcare issues, but we also have a solution. It's a fact that people live longer if they live within 300 meters to a green space. And according to recent research shown on this slide by, the, by Natural England and Newcastle University, access to landscape is more relevant than ever in the context of modern urban lifestyles as researchers research has demonstrated that it improves, improves our health outcomes. 
So what stands out for me in this research is that contact with nature improves mental health and well-being even after seven days. It is so quick and simple that we can achieve this. And children growing up in, a, in green surroundings have 55% less risk of mental health later in life. So this growing evidence base confirms that spending on healthcare could be reduced if we had greater investment made in preventing ill health before it has a chance to occur. And this can be done by providing high quality green space. And going back to the impact of COVID-19, this has changed many people's priorities and they have come to appreciate how important their gardens and parks are to them. And these recent surveys confirm these findings. So the evidence confirms that spending on healthcare could be reduced if green, greater investment was made in our green infrastructure and making space for nature in our towns and cities. It also makes sense both climate for the climate and biodiversity crisis too. And this can be achieved by taking a natural capital approach to ensure environmental net gain. We need to design and retrofit our cities with green infrastructure, tree planting to cool the city, sustainable urban drainage and space for nature to thrive. And I'm pleased to say it is beginning to happen. At the LI Awards last month, there were fantastic examples of retrofitting our cities and towns with green. And I chose Cater Park in Kidbrook Village as my first President's Award. It also received the first Sir David Attenborough Award for Enhancing Biodiversity. It's a green space in the heart of the city that offers an inspiring example of new nature inclusive approach to public realm design. And only this week, uh, we were pleased to announce the winners of the Transforming the Urban Landscape. And the brief for this competition was how our urban spaces would need to be adapted to incorporate measures needed to restrict the spread of COVID and other airborne diseases. And it also looked at how, we've the, how the design of our urban spaces could mitigate the effects of climate change. We had over 160 entries from students and professionals, and you can see those entries on the online exhibition if you're interested in finding out more. The winning entry, uh, this is from the professional category, Back Down to Earth, was a comprehensive approach on what we need for real post-COVID green recovery in our urban landscapes. And it brought together to prove it's all possible in one street. It's a fantastic idea of how we could retrofit our cities. And the winner of the student entry addresses the importance of nature in, in the city with habitat creation whilst addressing issues of pollution and climate change with some really good practical design solutions. The entries really demonstrated what we can do as landscape professionals. We have the ingenuity, we have the creativity and the technical ability to deliver. So here's our challenge. Are we at that tipping point or even pushing at an open door? Epidemics and pandemics have their own temporality. Panic disappears very quickly and people very rarely follow up. This current crisis could be a once in a generation opportunity to take a step back and reassess fundamental assumptions about our, how our towns and cities are structured. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was brilliant, Jane. Um, I think lots for everybody to think about there. And uh, we've had a question about slides from Neil, whether they will be available um, at the end of this. Actually, we do record these. I should maybe have mentioned that. I hope that's all OK with everybody. And we will be putting the recordings up on um, Vimeo and uh, YouTube so that you can access all of the previous ones and this. And I'm sure if you wanted particular slides that if you got in touch with uh, any, anybody, Marie Jane or Christopher today, that they would be able to help. So please do that. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll move on to Christopher now, um, if you're ready with yours. Okay. Can you see that everybody? Yes. Thanks, Christopher. I don't know if you need to uh, go uh, full yeah. screen. Yeah, there perfect. We go. Thanks. Um, Thank you. So uh, this morning I'm going to be talking you through um, my idea, which was selected uh, as part of the developer magazine Radical We Think Cool for Ideas, which was um, uh, sponsored by Vestra. And um, I'm, I guess I'm the slight outlier here today in that I'm not a landscape 
professional, but um, a, a planning and development school there, uh, working for a company called Axiom Developments, and we uh, promote uh, large-scale urban extensions or new settlements through local plans and neighbourhood plan processes. And um, I guess um, kind of one of the first things that I get asked is uh, kind of what 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 is the land value, and uh, kind of what's what's the project going to be worth? Um, and really, at it at its kind of simplest sort of bag packet, bag packet terms, the the residual method is the gross development value and minus the cost of creating the uh, the development plus um, the profit is the uh, residual land value. Um, but the problem with uh, this method is that the land value is determined by gross development value, um, which is driven by fitting the most revenue generating floor space on a site and then selling or, le or leasing that for the highest price. Um, and when, when Simon Kuznets uh, de defined the concept of gross domestic product as a, as a monetary me measure of, the, of market value, he, he also warned against its use as a measure uh, of welfare. Um, and this is, uh, this is the same is true of gross development value. Um, and so this, it, it, this, this approach ignores a, a large, an essential part of the value chain. And, and this got me thinking, what if another metric could be, could be measured and included in, in GDV? Um, as we as we know, the the and uh, as, as Jane and uh, Mary have just kind of talked us through that the social value um, of a development is mostly created in the public spaces between the buildings and the the activities happening in and around the sites. Um, and the value of and importance of well-designed and flexible public spaces um, has only increased through through the ongoing lockdown. The convening outdoors in parks, squares, plazas, and streets uh, around our homes becoming an ever increasing uh, and valued part of our social life. Um, creating these uh, public spaces sits firmly within the kind of the cost column um, of, of a development, but the value and benefit created through these spaces um, is not easily accounted for in the in the gross, gross development value. Um, this is either because it's uh, either intangible. Uh, the, Difficult to quantify or, or not recognised until much later in the in the project cycle. Um, social value creation is at the core of, of a robust planning system. Um, however, current policies and, and appraisal processes are not unlocking the full social value of new, new developments. Um, with developer contributions, a, a kind of a stick to a uh, rather than uh, than in fire. And uh, kind of sadly, under under current policies, it, it's possible that that a lot of the social infrastructure proposed can can later be kind of watered down, value engineered out, or could removed through uh, planning viability or 106 uh, negotiations. Um, and this kind of creates distrust of the uh, developers and councils from from the local communities. Um, according to a briefing note published by the Social Value Portal, uh, integrating the Social Value Act into the planning process has the potential to unlock an additional 15 billion of value for communities across the UK each, uh, every year. Um, so this got me thinking, how can we better quantify the potential social value of public and community spaces so that it forms a greater part of the appraisal process, uh, making the social value um, the, the starting point rather than being a bit uh, left around the around the edges. So, th so I, I think a simple toolkit is needed to help all developers, communities and, and councils to appraise and measure the social value created through, through the land uses and, and, and public spaces. We have seen uh, the introduction of the biodiversity net gain calculator to support uh, the, the, the policy. And uh, so is, could something similar be created to measure the, the, the potential social value of, of a scheme? Uh, there, are, there are many developers uh, and, and social value consultants who, who use their own bespoke tools and methods. Uh, one of where either kind of cost benefit analysis or cost resource savings um, or the kind of sustainable return on investment. Um, a lot of the existing tools and methods, uh, they, the problem is they are often complex uh, they require kind of trained professionals, um, need a lot of data, and and often leave, uh, don't actually mean much to the end user, kind of the, the, the residents and the communities that uh, that live live there. So, I think it, it could be time to kind of simplify the process and the language used, and, and one one simple toolkit that could be be uh, understood and and used by all stakeholders. 
Um, so the first of the kind of seven social value principles is, is to you know, in, involve stakeholders, and, and that's uh, anyone affected by your activities, primarily the, the local community and the local council. And the, the starting point is, is to quantify who and what is already there, the residents, current land uses, the local demographics, uh, what is unique to the character of, of the, the area and any specific issues and constraints. Uh, and this will determine a baseline measurement and current and social value score. And really uh, through, the, through the consultation process, uh, points can be scored against each, each of the land use metrics and weighting given to the areas that matter most to that community and help steer proposals that deliver the, the most social value uh, and, and also set a target for the, for the developer. Um, so what could it look like? What are, what's, uh, where, where is social value created? I've, I've put a lot of things up there and you know, a lot of which we'll be discussing and have been, have been discussed earlier. Um, I think it's you know, what is the purpose of, of, of these spaces and um, is there agency that, for the community to control and shape what happens? How is it run? Is it a kind of self-sustaining landscape? And really it's kind of trying to measure and value the things that, uh, that, that matter most. So um, how might this look? I've um, I, I think used the, uh, the kind of energy performance certificate template. Um, could we do something similar for the kind of social value created in our public spaces and public realm? Um, it's a simple visual uh, that is easy to understand uh, by, by everyone, really. Um, and then the, the a social value score can be agreed for the current use, the potential use, and then the actual year, use once the uh, the scheme is delivered. Um, this means that the, the developer has a clear target to work towards, um, which will result in a social value placemaking benchmark, such as the social value certificate. Um, and this is agreed between all parties at, ahead, of, ahead of planning, um, and then can be an ongoing measurement tool through the, through the project lifecycle. Um, this is going to sound like more work and cost Cost for, for the developers. Um, why why would they use it? I think at, it, at its core, I think we, there needs to be as much kind of transparency and accountability uh, for, for for creating social value. Um, and then, how does this feed back into the kind of GDB and the appraisal process? I think it's better designed places um, will enhance end values uh, uh, and the, kind of the the uses across the scheme. And there, there are then significant kind of cost savings through innovative approaches to land use, particularly with the drainage infrastructure and through through collab collaboration between different disciplines. Um, I think using the, the the social value certificate, the um, those developers and schemes that score higher may then have could have access to uh, um, cheaper funding or, or favorable developer levy banding, and then those not performing and delivering uh, social value, they could find themselves with uh, increased development levy or taxation through land value capture. Um, but really it, it's looking to put, um, put the power in the hands of the, the developers and their, 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 cons their consultant teams to be creative, bold, and brave in the creation of new, new places. Um, and the, the idea is that the, the scheme will wear the social value certificate with pride um, and, and that it then is a kind of ongoing management uh, through, through, through the life cycle. Um, I think with the rise in slow purpose-driven cap capital, the approach to appraisals and value, valuations will need to change and go beyond a purely financial return metric. And uh, I've kind of been inspired by the principles outlined by Kate Rayworth in her, her book, Donut Economics. And I, I'd argue that it's it's time for a more holistic approach to growth development value to the, ensure that the the social value and the eco ecological benefits are accounted for and embedded in the development process. Um, and there are the many developers creating great places with with real purpose um, at the core, with real social purpose at the core. Um, but these shouldn't be the exception. And I hope that uh, my idea for social value certificates could be a way for all developers to incorporate social value into their process. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christopher. That was brilliant. Um, I think lots to think about, lots to discuss, hopefully. So if anybody has any questions, please do add them. Um, I'm going to go back into uh, sharing 
my screen shortly and then we'll we'll carry on um, the conversation and a couple of polls that we were wanting to run by you. Um, so just the first discussion point we really wanted to involve uh, our three speakers on is um, what have you seen in terms of the changes brought about by COVID over this last year? Um, and this is around climate change, whether our spaces have become more or less equitable or democratic and, and how do we improve um, this situation through community or public engagement particularly. So I don't know, Christopher, if you want to just start with that, because that was particularly what you were talking about in your last few slides, how critical uh, community engagement is. Yes, um, I think with as the uh, the, you know, the current um, kind of lockdown has uh, has, has um, demonstrated that kind of community is is everything, and kind of as as developers, um, we have a huge responsibility to to uh, involve the the community in 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 kind of shaping what what is built, and um, and so it's it's is looking at how how best to engage. And, and draw out the kind of the key themes from that community to, to understand what values most to them and uh, then how how to agree that and then how to kind of bring it bring it forward through the through the planning and, and development process. Mm. I've just got a question just before I jump on to Jane or Marie um, from Neil Chapman. He's asking, he says he likes all of this yeah. and it's a good time to move forward. How how do we make this happen? I think um, we've had a similar question from Stephen Boxall really about we all know the value of landscape. We all know um, the link with well-being, you know, and, mm. and all of us here, I think, are, are not needing to be convinced of that. But actually, how do we make the changes? He's particularly asking, um, how do we encourage the public not to accept more austerity and lack of spending in these areas? And that's actually very much what we're coming on to, I think, uh, shortly prioritising and valuing people's health. But um, have you got any thoughts on how we can actually do something now with, with your gross social value plans i'm working on it <laughs> um, <laughs> i think we might need more than you working yeah, on I, it. Think, <laughs> I think i think as we we may come on to later i think it's 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 collaboration across all the all the various disciplines um and mm. not and all working together um i think i think the, the communities are taking greater interest in in their in their in their public spaces as a result of COVID and it is looking at effective ways of, of, uh, of making sure their voices are heard and demonstrated. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of great community engagement tools. And I think perhaps what I'm suggesting with social value, the social value certificates is that that can be embedded in the community engagement process so that they really set the value of, of what is important and what they want to see delivered in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, yeah, it's, it's um, getting everyone around the table early, all disciplines so that things aren't already kind of half-baked by the time you, someone else becomes involved. I think it's really starting with a, a blank sheet of paper and getting everyone sitting around the table and, and, and starting from the ground up. I, I hope it will change. I've been kind of involved in conversations about silos for the 30 years <laughs> that I've been working in this profession I think Marie and Jane are both yes <laughs> yeah I, it's absolutely <laughs> true no 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 I mean it's it's so true but it's so hard isn't it uh, Marie you you did a lot of research for for your book clearly in the last um, few months and years so maybe you you've seen more of the changes from the last nine months do, do you see positive or negative changes particularly brought about by Covid in these spaces that you wrote about um, well, I, I think, and, and also looking at, at practice, I think that um, the, the need for public space is obviously, in some respects, has been brought up the agenda, like we've all been speaking about. Um, I think it's actually looking how that the implementation of creating either new public spaces or improving existing ones, which are not sort of fit for purpose. I think that's really the challenge. And I think also it's about um, thinking about the scale, um, whilst um, Christopher and Jane were talking, what was going through my mind is actually how different city centres are now. Mm. And I, perversely, many city centres are more pedestrianised and have got access to more public spaces. 
than actually when you move out to the suburbs and then beyond that. So I think there's also a discussion that needs to be had about those areas that were developed um, in say the 50s that were more sort of like suburban and car dependent when in their design, mm -hmm. which actually have less access to um, uh, improved or better public space um, that you can get to just by walking. Mm. And I, I think it's, it's actually that coupled with where new developments are taking place. It's actually, sure, there's obviously city centre focus. Maybe that may be a bit slowed down in this just at this moment. But that's also in the suburban areas is actually where the housing uh, focus is definitely going to be. So how do we and the planners and others and the existing communities ensure that when these developments are put forward, they are part of a sort of more sort of a master plan or an agenda to actually have the right amount of public space for the new development and also um, public space that can also be used so by the local community as well. So I think you know, it's a vast conversation. But I think yes. we're at a moment yeah. in time whereby, um, in a way, it does need to be had because um, it's not going to be seen to be high on the agendas of many people. But going forward, unless we start tackling it now, it will be on the agenda of for the lack of open space for future generations. Mm, no, absolutely. And we don't want another 30 years to go by with the same conversations here. <laughs> Jane, you've mentioned in your presentation the changes um, in the last few months, even in, in aspects like the LI Awards and the recent competition. Do you, do you feel more positive seeing? I mean, the skills are obviously there amongst the people that we know, but do you feel more positive that they'll actually be enacted, some of these proposals, or, or will they remain sort of uh, nice pictures on slides? <laughs> Well, I, I think I think there are two two parts to that, um, Romy. It's a good question because I think we need to raise the expectations of the public to come to expect more from mm. our developments, and to expect more to be provided at that local level. You know, you, you look at any suburb around the immediate city centre, and they're always the poorest. They're the ones that are going to be affected, uh, that have been affected the most by COVID. The people who live there are also going to be the ones that are probably going to be most affected by climate change, particularly when it comes to the urban heat island effect. And they're the areas that generally have the worst provision of public space because they're often the old slum clearances mm. and the high density high rise with very poor green space. And I think retrofitting there is going to be important, but it's making sure that people I think it's raising people's expectations because some people, a lot of people, a lot of us don't realize what can be done. And there are some fantastic examples around the world. And when people go and buy a new house, sometimes they're looking so, they're so focused on the new house, they're not looking at the, the location. And um, we want people to start asking our developers, where is the park? How, how, how can I go out on my bike? And you know, those sort of things. So I think it, there's an education process or make, us as professionals making people more aware of what they can have what's mm. possible but I also think that uh, legislation is going to be crucial because without legislation I don't think anything will will be done mm. unless uh, it's there in black and white um, and this then uh, it will then require people to developers to provide uh, quality space we also then have to uh, make, ensure that it's legislated in some way to provide beautiful uh, space, not just, mm. you know, some close mown grass and a, a lollipop tree in the middle of it as a box yeah. picking exercise. So I think it's, 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 it's bottom up, top down. Uh, and I think there'll be, I'm hoping that people won't forget how it's been this last few months and how awful it has been for those people who live in high density areas. Mm, no, I think that's a that's a, a really important point. Thank you. Um, I'm going to run the poll now for this section. And I, I, while we do it, I've got a couple of uh, questions that we can um, talk about. While, while hopefully in the background you're, you're filling in this, I'll leave it up on the screen. Um, but have a look at how you feel COVID has brought about these changes um, and whether they are positive or negative. 
Um, and Stephen Boxall has asked, he says that, uh, Christopher, your ideas are interesting, um, but, but still a, a neoliberal economic game of valuing what you can attach a price tag to. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these requirements um, have to be set out in planning policy anyway and adhered yeah. to. So the planning permission should become the social value certificate. Um, yeah. Have you got a response for that? Or, or how does your idea take this further or make it more likely to happen maybe yeah um i know i, I agree with uh with, with all that was it steve um it was it, it saying that the, the the planning permission should be the, the the social value certificate i think where i um i think part of the idea is is, is spawned from that despite the the uh the, the planning permission that there are still mechanisms for, for for developers to to uh, water down some of the, the benefits of, mm. of, um, of of a scheme through through kind of negotiations. They're particularly in a kind of competitive environment where they've overpaid for the land. They either they they then kind of are trying to re reverse engineer their way to 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 to, to profit, which mm. and and sadly that is um, is. Uh, Possible through through the current planning planning mm. system, and so I think just with with my idea, I'm, I'm just hoping that that becomes a badge that after you know once it's been delivered, it's then assessed against what it sets out to do and the what was what it was given permission, what a, a scheme was given for permission for, for has that actually been delivered, um, and that stops any potential for kind of value engineering through the through the construction processes and things mm. not. That, that were set out as part of the because I think there's, there's too many communities that are promised something by the developer as part of the kind of the pre-planning community engagement process and then once it arrives on and it, it's delivered it, it's somewhat uh, not as they that it, that mm. expected so I'm just looking for a mechanism that can and can keep uh, a kind of transparent process through the the the, the, the life cycle of uh, mm. of these these spaces. And we wanted to talk about that uh, in a moment about um, whether we require more or less legislation. So mm -hmm. no, thank you. We can pick that up again there. I'll end the poll. Um, thanks to those of you who have uh, competed, uh, sorry, completed, not competed that. Um, I mean, that's reassuring. That was maybe unexpected that most of you feel that the changes have been positive in terms of climate change, even though there may be more people getting in cars and uh, all the slightly less positive things that we hear about. Um, everything else is a little less clear maybe i'm not sure everyone's feeling particularly confident that it's brought about all of the positive changes we'd have liked to see um but yeah it's it's something to um to think about we'd better move on because i'm aware of time uh progressing and uh, i don't want to run over too much for everybody uh, so the next conversation we wanted to have, which we have obviously been already doing, and um, it's really just picking up on a couple of other points, but again, actually coming back to the financing of things. Um, how do we really value and prioritise people's health in terms of uh, landscape focus? Um, you know, we, we talked amongst ourselves before about there's a, there's a bandied about number of spending one pound on landscape equates to 11 pounds for the NHS in terms of social prescribing and healthy outcomes. Jane, this is your real sort of area of expertise, I guess. You know, have you, have you got thoughts on how we actually do push more for what we are talking about here and, and you know, get that kind of spending in place when it's maybe not there in the first place um, in public funds? Uh, and Romy, you, you know this. This is a really difficult subject because uh, you even suggest taking money away from the NHS to pay for a park. Mm -hmm. uh, people are up in arms. You know, what about the, the the new scanner my hospital needs? You know, can we we can't provide care for elderly people in their own homes. It is such an emotive subject. It's really mm -hmm. difficult to deal with. But at the end of the day. Uh, uh, health is created at home. Hospitals only address the symptoms of a health problem. And until we get into that uh, way of thinking, we're only ever going to be addressing the symptoms, not the cause of ill health. 
So um, the, the, I think governments do recognize that by improving housing standards, reducing uh, uh, atmospheric pollution, until those things start to happen, that um, health uh, of, the, of, of our communities isn't going to improve. Mm -hmm. um, but what actually is the tipping point? Well, I wonder whether uh, some of the things we've seen this last uh, this last year might be might provide that tipping point because already uh, conversations that I'm having with politicians, and in fact, I was invited on a panel this week. It's the Westminster um, um, uh, panel looking at. Um, air pollution in our towns and cities across the country mm. and they had started to look at it just as air pollution and I was trying to tell them or suggest it's more than just looking at air pollution if we're looking at air pollution you're looking at climate change you look at health and the the sort of the base we got to is this until we start to really grapple with um health it um and all these other things, and what I'm trying to say is all these things come together. You mm. can't look at them in their silos. It's so holistic. Yeah. Health is really important and health is dependent on climate change, on biodiversity, mm. all these other things. So, it, yeah, I think we have to start um, putting a monetary value on some of these things to really understand what the true costs of not having um, mm. environments that support um, good health. Are yeah. Important. Yeah, absolutely. No, and there's a question here actually from Jazraj, uh, maybe for you, Marie, um, asking what do you think, uh, how, sorry, how do you think public spaces can be modified to improve mental health further, e.g. open space biodiversity? Have you got any sort of straightforward ideas around that? I think that one of the most important thing is for um, public spaces, you know, whether they're hard or soft, um, in character um, to be accessible and accessible to everybody, but also to be thinking um, how accessible they are um, both, both during the day and in the evenings. So they don't just become closed off spaces when, you know, when it becomes dark. I think that's quite important. I think going back to just following on from what Jane um, was, um, was saying mm -hmm. is that there does need to be um, a review of how actually money is accrued. And I think it's also what Krista is advocating, is that um, money, that there needs to be a sort of um, a percentage of um, any development to um, open space. And I know that certainly was the case in, in the Oslo examples. That, and it's also in terms of examples in other parts of Europe where there seems to be a bit more um, control, uh, local control of, of monies, that money can be put into the creation of parks and, and um, new open spaces. So that actually money does become ring fenced. So that as part of sort of an overall plan or agenda for an area, money can be ring fenced to actually um, either create better streets because it's also about context of open spaces. They're, they're not islands in themselves. They need mm. to be seen as part of a sort of a, a holistic approach to actually recreating or creating our, our cities. So you are actually creating places that people can walk to, but the walk needs to be good. People can cycle to, and the cycleways need to be put in. Yeah. So I, I, it, it actually is a bit, um, and, and in so doing, it means that just as um, Jane was describing in her um, attending that um, Westminster panel, that everyone, there is lots and lots of actors that need to be put together to create this, um, sort of new way of looking at our towns and cities uh, and and also allowing everyone the right voice mm -hmm. in those rooms and in those discussions so so that you know the best um, designs and the best environments can, can actually be can be achieved and it's not going to happen overnight and I think that's where sometimes you know mm -hmm. the master plans if they're if they're in place actually at least give um, uh, a sort of vision of what what can happen, and actually how you no know, different funding can be triggered if you've, if you've got a plan in place, mm -hmm. um, and also how the different communities within a plan can also um, sort of determine what's going on as well. So, so I think that um, the value on people's health, I think that can certainly be pushed further at this moment in time, but it's also how how we get that and. Uh, no, it's like the, the, the more recent um, 
mayor's initiative on, on, on um, healthy streets with its sort of uh, list of um, uh, improvements that can contribute to um, I mean, sort of a healthier city living. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm aware we're running a little bit late in, in danger of um, overrunning. So I'll launch this this second poll um, and uh, just see what your thoughts are on this uh, next question. Um, sorry, I just need to get the next one up. Um, but we've got a few more queries coming, I think. So this one is about prioritizing and valuing um, people's health. And, it, and, it, and it's a little bit more personal. Do you feel our green spaces currently support your and your family's health um, locally to where you are? And while you're thinking about that one, um, Stephen has made the point again, which I think is just a point to make to everybody, but it comes back to Christopher, what you were saying, we must stop the viability test um, yeah. as this enables planning permission to be renegotiated, let the developers fail and lose money. They will then learn not to pay too much for the site. I, that is definitely one way of yeah. <laughs> addressing this, isn't it? Um, and maybe, maybe you know, amidst all the craziness, that is something that has to be thought about. <laughs> yeah, and um, in the, 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 the planning white paper is, is, is setting out that, the, that there's more of a uh, straightforward approach to developer contributions, which I, mm. I, I hope that will can take out the the, the, the the potential for viability. Yes. Testing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm going to move on quite quickly. Um, it's an end this poll, although I think some of you are still mulling it over. But actually, that's that's nice to see. At least half of you, at least, um, maybe more. Those that are unconvinced uh, feel that your needs are being addressed, but there's clearly more work to do there. Um, and very quickly, I think we're going to have to move on to the next point, uh, which comes back to a lot of what we've spoken about already, I think. But but we also, when we were talking before today, um, discussed money that was available. And when you put a value on health, you know, what we're actually talking about. And we were talking about the green recovery spending being about four billion, which we all hope here will have some outcome positively for all of us but actually you do need to put that against the 16 billion that's been recently agreed to be spent on uh, defense so you know it's all as we say it's all holistic and part of a bigger pot isn't it really so the final um, point that we wanted to discuss today and I hope you can stay with us for maybe another five minutes is is really who does what you know who is more legislation needed as I mentioned before um, bearing in mind we've got oops, sorry Bearing in mind we've got a diminishing pool of um, skills, of professionals, um, and we talked about already not working in silos. We need much more of a, a positive um, multidisciplinary team on all of this. What are our thoughts on that? Um, you know, sh should the developer be uh, more enforced um, or, or left to their own devices and left to fail, as we've just said? You know, what, what do we do? I think maybe one point from each of you on how we might change uh, this for the better. So Christopher, would you like to start and give us your <laughs> view? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was, that was very kind of you to let me go first. Um, I think it's a combination. I, I think we require legis uh, legislation to get things in, in underway and, and, make, and to have, make all parties act. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But it's also leaving enough space for, for those to to kind of be be creative and 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 uh and um in, in creating great spaces so um a, mm. a combination of the two and and then again it's kind of collaboration amongst all all um all disciplines as much as possible um i also uh, think that, that the uk gbc are, are doing a great job of acting as a as a kind of a, a great resource for kind of social value and so that that has been you know, Great, great for me to kind of learn. Uh, but I think mm. we are seeing kind of RICS and and the uh, RCPI and Green Build Building Council all kind of working, all working together. And so I would just encourage that kind of as much as possible. Mm. Yeah. No. Thank you, Jane. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with Chris. I think collaboration is absolutely essential because we're all going at this if we're not careful um, um, individually as individual organisations. So I think mm. collaboration between all the, the built environment professions and so on, I think that's really important. 
I think the three key things are legislation. Uh, Singapore had legislation and it's made the world of difference to that city and uh, developers have to comply with that. And some of the outcomes have been fantastic. I think in this country, particularly, we need enforcement because at the moment our planning system can't enforce even the most simplest of, of planning conditions and the planning authorities need help to be able to do that. They need the manpower. And I think engagement with communities, I think our communities need to be able to say what they want and have mm. a, an input into that. So I think those are three key things. OK, thanks. And Marie, your thoughts on yeah. carrot or stick? <laughs> um, just, just fine. I, I think it's actually very important that um, the local authorities are actually strengthened. I know I'm saying that in in a time when they are most stretched and going to be further stretched. But mm. I say it in that there does need to be um, a sort of continuity and a building up of um, um, information and um, experience within local authorities mm. so that they can um, have meaningful conversations uh, with um, developers and mm. others. Uh, and in so doing, I think it's, gives a continuity um, approach that actually then becomes part of already the sort of the backdrop to it to any dialogue and so things aren't done in a piecemeal fashion um, but actually done as part of a wider um, sort of city or um, town um, approach to uh, regeneration and, and development. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, this holistic approach is coming across loud and clear in, in every sense, isn't it? Um, I'm just going to launch the last poll. I hope some of you can stay with us. I, we are really pretty much at the end now. I appreciate everybody's busy and it's um, getting a bit near Christmas, so we're all desperate to get on to other things. While you're um, having a, a look at that, I will just go through a couple of the points on the chat, um, because Wayne Grill, CEO of uh, Bali, um, made a comment about this interdisciplinary approach and uh, he talks about the collaborative work taking place in the industry through the ornamental horticulture roundtable group working with government departments to put horticulture back on the government agenda and that's I think an important point about the skills probably as much as anything else that we're going to need so he's had to go as I sh I'm sure a few others have because we've hit the hour um, Neil Chapman says regarding the last poll, maybe a hope more than an a hope more than an expectation. So, yeah, I think he may be right. And Jazraj also says, um, I think art has a place in public spaces. It's vital for people to express their feelings towards anything on their mind and allow themselves to feel better. It has a positive impact for social value. And thank you for these uh, mind opening presentations. So some really nice uh, thoughts there. If anyone else has any anything to say please do add them and I'm going to close the poll very shortly there is a there are about 10 of you now still to um, take part in that oh yeah that's had an effect thank you so <laughs> I think three two one uh, here we go I think there are enough people to yeah it's a fairly positive result for the stick <laughs> rather <laughs> than the carrot <laughs> um, yeah, so it comes back, I think, at developers and uh, enforcement, which I guess is probably what most people are feeling. I'm so sorry, but th there is one person who feels developers are generally doing a good job. That wasn't you, was it, Christopher? <laughs> My hands were tied. I wasn't allowed. <laughs> okay, no, I was going to say, I was wondering, yeah. So that's, that's interesting uh, as well. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I think this this will all be available afterwards, as will the recording. So, um, you know, if anybody does want to catch up on on all of these uh, bits of information, please do let us know. We, we do record, as I say. And uh, I'm just going to move on because we are coming up to 10 minutes late now. So it brings this session to a close um, and just a few minutes now to round up. I hope that some of SDG 11 is now more tangible to you. That's really the purpose of these FICAs, and we cover one every month, which those of you who have joined us will know. It's about how we can all contribute to making positive changes. That is the intent, even in tiny ways. That's our belief at Vestra that we can all do a little to uh, improve things, and some of us can do a lot, I think. Um, and again, I think in terms of valuing and, and prioritizing, I think we should also bear in mind as much as the 
horrific air pollution stories and um, the uh, UCL article I mentioned earlier. It was only, I think, Wednesday this week that UNICEF launched an emergency response to feed hungry children in the UK for the first time in 70 years. So we have to remember that although we all here are convinced of the things we ought to be doing to improve our nation's health and well-being, um, everybody is competing for this same pot of money which Jane mentioned earlier and when you look at prioritizing spending it's so subjective if you consider that there are starving children in Southwark um, right well, all over the place but particularly in Southwark obviously with this announcement by UNICEF which is unbelievable really in in every single way um, but moving on to, to just close these these topics are discussed in our newsletter so if you haven't already signed up please do you'll find the sign up on our about page on the website and we talk about using design as a tool for change anti-hostile design inclusive public spaces on there quite regularly so please do sign up there or or and or our social media and instagram in particular you'll find lots of posts on the same sort of subjects and do look out our uh, CEO's recent TEDx um, talk on, on uh, the green economy. It's, it's brilliant and only 10 minutes, <laughs> so you don't need a lot of time. And it just remains to thank everybody uh, listening, everybody here for giving up your precious time. We really do appreciate it. And don't forget these hours count towards your CPD commitment. Um, and many of our subjects actually would, would be classed under the minimum five hours a year that the Landscape Institute has asked uh, every member to take on about the climate emergency. And please do get in touch. We're very open to ideas or thoughts on upcoming FICAs. Um, we have these listed here now. Uh, in January, we're going to be talking about the High Streets Task Force with some really interesting speakers. And if you've missed previous ones, this is our sixth. Uh, we, we have them all available, recorded, as I mentioned before, so we'll send out links to those. And um, obviously there are sort of standard CPD, CPDs that you can follow up. So thank you again, particularly Jane, Marie and Christopher for your time. Also my colleagues, Matt and Jack, who've been in the background helping out and making sure I stay on track. And good week. Have a great weekend. Uh, go Helg and great Christmas. Go Yule. And uh, if you had the recipe for Glug earlier, then do make some maybe tonight because Aquavit needs not to be not you're not to be working, to be honest. <laughs> so do celebrate at some point and I hope you have a fabulous uh, holiday and festive break and see you next year. Thank So thank you, everybody, and yes, hope you. to see you soon. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.